Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to start with a proposition, a proposition that isn't mine, but actually placed by Jared Diamond in his book on collapse, how societies choose to fail or survive. You remember his major proposition was that environmental failure led to reduced production, led to disease, led to collapse of society. Now, to an extent, I agree with him, but it's also clear to me from my own experience working in rural Africa as an infectious diseases uh, specialist that, in fact, health can trigger these collapses much more so than I I he gives credit to in his book. The best example, the collapse of fishing communities on Lake Victoria as a consequence of HIV, where you have actually loss of manpower and productivity due to a major epidemic that occurred in that area. The hypothesis is that this cannot uh, be taken in isolation. What I'm going to propose to you is that we have to look at this as a form of triangulation. The triangulation that exists is between food production, the community, and health. And the tragedy of this is that this is an extremely fragile dynamic. An attack on any one of these elements will damage all of the others. And if a community cannot sustain agriculture or buy agricultural products from elsewhere by excess being produced in terms of agriculture, then nutrition will suffer and the structure of the community will change and the priorities within that community will change. If health is under attack, it becomes difficult to sustain agriculture and education. And then if education collapses, then the community itself is going to disintegrate. So if you take that microcosm of a village community, um, this works in a completely interdependent system. Clear-cut example of the fragility of this system is well exemplified by wheat monoculture. Um, what we have here is the vulnerability of a particular crop. We've got this hexaploid <coughs> crop on which 60% of the nutritional value actually depends. And yet, as was pointed out by uh, Dr. Borlaug, uh, who worked in relationship to the Green Revolution in India, the onset of black stem rust in a monoculture system had immense potential for both social and human destruction. And you only have to look back as to what was the underlying cause of the sudden rise in wheat prices from the previous hike up and look at the impact on that on particular communities. Great if your wheat survived and you could get additional economic benefit, but for most communities it did not survive particularly well. Now having said all of that, I'm actually no pass pessimist. And Jared similarly makes the case that while there is a trajectory for collapse within societies, it is not linear and it is by no means inevitable. For me, therefore, that has to be a call to action and one in which we have to take some optimism. Now, in my current job, it's a long way from the communities I used to work with in Senegal and the Gambia. The office where I sit in, in Cambridge, is often surrounded by thousands of individuals walking past in a day. They're some of the best brains in the world, make no bones about that. But actually when you ask them what they really want to work towards, they do want to work towards a better world. The motivation at academic level is extreme and it's very, very real. So we have to work towards solutions and from my perspective I have to ask the question what is the role of the university in trying to help promote that type of activity? Well, normally you would start as an academic from the need to understand how to attack the problem because the triangle I've imagined represents a problem in multiple dimensions. Any imaginable solution to the problem will need to be holistic and exist in the same dimensions as the problem. In other words, a cross-disciplinary solution to a cross-disciplinary problem, not a siloed solution. It needs health specialists, educationists, social scientists, agronomists, on and on and on, the list goes on. And from my perspective, the university is an ideal starting point, particularly the larger universities, provided they can work with local um, enterprises effectively uh, downstream. Researchers with disciplines come together and create interdisciplinary strategic initiatives. That's the way of every modern university. I think the old-fashioned idea that universities work in silos has got to be put to bed. Universities have moved on a long, long way. If you take a siloed model as a university today, you're dead in the water. To remain globally competitive as a university, you have to think outside silos, create interdisciplinary institutes, and move forward. Not a bad starting point to try to tackle this issue. 
The second issue that I'd like to just uh, dwell on a little is the issue that this triangulation is more complex than even appears in a multidisciplinary ways because in fact there is a fourth dimension and the fourth dimension is that this is an ever-changing dynamic I mean remember this problem that we're talking about first started when the agrarian revolution occurred somewhere in the basin of Mesopotamia way back in Paleolithic times it was a problem for Stone Age man then how do you actually get sufficient production to a problem today and I'm going to tell you that despite being an optimist this problem will not go away and although the problem may change the problem will continue so short-term solutions or thinking we can create a fund and fix the problem I have to tell you I don't think we're ever going to fix this problem because we haven't in four or five thousand years and I don't think we're going to fix it today but we have to work on it because the populations are totally dependent uh, on our answers in a way, you've seen those puzzles uh, the children very often have, where you take a hammer and you hit one block and something else pops up for the child to hit again. This is the very nature of the problem we actually have uh, here. It has unpredictability. We want to develop systems that are predictable in outcome. Governments want to put a tax on something because it's a predictable outcome. Any mathematician will tell you we're dealing with a chaotic system where pull just one lever you do not know the consequences of pulling the lever uh, that, that you actually pull. So be prepared for some chaotic uh, behavior around this system. And I'll only highlight one, and it is, from my perspective, the disproportionality that exists in communicable diseases in rural societies, still a, a real problem, but I'm gonna give you a prediction. Within five years, even in rural communities here in India, that is going to be overtaken by non-communicable diseases. 340 million avoidable deaths in the next 10 years. 80% of that burden falls on less developed countries, not on the developed worlds. These are not diseases of affluence anymore. They're diseases that are of global significance. 60% of all avoidable deaths in non-communicable diseases exist in the developing world. And yet we have healthcare systems that are orientated towards infectious diseases, quick fixes and not actually thinking about the healthcare culture that we need to promote downstream. Just ponder the impact on productivity of psychiatric disease. Never mentioned <coughs> Cinderella specialties. 8% of the population of India will need access to psychiatric care sometime in their lives and the longer they live the more likely they are to need it. Productivity suffers with psychiatric disease. We know from Western societies most patients with psych serious psychiatric illness move to the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum. Just imagine that happening within smaller communities heavily dependent on an agricultural system when there is no way in which that health is delivered unless you reorientate uh, health care. And the costs don't even bear thinking about. You can see what's escalated but as a fraction of GDP in Western societies, that is an unsustainable model. Therefore, local delivery and local care systems are vital. So in finishing, I'm actually going to say that university researchers tackle real-world problems all the time. Don't think you're discovering something new. They do it, and they do it in an interdisciplinary way. They also are increasingly do it in a local context. One of the reasons I'm here in India is actually to look to forge the partnerships that a university like Cambridge needs to have to help resolve some of these issues. We can put some input into it, but we need the local input into it and the local knowledge and the local expertise and academic expertise that already exists in strengths here. But if you think what the consequences might be if we do nothing, that's the worst of all. And I'm going to finish, not with my own words, but with a poem that has stuck with me ever since I first read it as a schoolboy. Um, I do have a predilection for the romantic poets of Britain and I'm going to refer to the words of Shelley written in 1818 and the poem's entitled Ozymandias I met a traveller from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled dip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed 
And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. No thing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. If that's the vision we don't want of societies today, that we've got to act now and act in the knowledge that we actually have to develop the interdisciplinarity, the knowledge base, and work together with what communities need to try to resolve the problems that we face.